for the trial uh, and recording is in progress. Please go ahead. So, is here? Sufi, sir. Gee, I can hear you. You yes. have the floor, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to the uh, seminar. It is always a matter of honor to appear in matters of this nature. Uh, the context in which I have been asked to intervene and interject is with reference to the right of fair trial and its ramifications and whether uh, to what extent it is entitling people to a fair trial process, whether these people are suspects or these people are undergoing any trial in any jurisdiction. And particularly it becomes important if these people are also undergoing trial in the context of uh, a struggle relating to self-determination or any associated resistance of an occupying power. That is where such trials become even more significant for the purposes of ensuring that people who are raising voices as and when they are put to any restraint of any category or under the charge which is allegedly criminal charge they are entitled to a fair trial because it is presumed that such charges are politically motivated and the purpose of levying such a charge and conducting a trial is not for objective reasons of a genuine offense, but rather a, a ploy being used or a tactic being used to silence a voice which is making an effective resistance. So therefore, the context in which a trial of any prisoner who is being subject to restraint, who has been subject to any prosecution or any charge in an occupying category state has to be reviewed with greater vigilance than a fair trial environment that is given to an ordinary citizen in a normal country because that citizen is capable of raising, questioning, challenging, the any aspect of the trial where he thinks the fairness of the procedure is being compromised. Now, having said that, we have several prisoners where we think uh, may I just for one moment. We have an audience who would love to see your uh, your your handsome face. If you'd be kind enough to turn on your sorry, uh, I I. Would you be kind enough to turn on the video so our audience may also... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I thought I was turning on the video. Okay. Well, I look... Uh, I just returned from Umrah. So, sighting is as decent as it can be for the time being. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sure uh, you are now... I'm seeing most of you, uh, some familiar faces and some faces that I have a lot of respect for and some guests as well. Anyhow, so if I can continue uh, with my contention uh, in, a, in a little moment, if you allow me to move to another venue, uh, it will be better. Just, just give me a give me a minute. While we wait for uh, Bilal Sufi, uh, I also mentioned um, it's on the record, but uh, as a side note, that uh, I've been a great admirer of uh, Sufi Sahib's work, uh, mainly because I have met him, and some of the uh, points and advice that he's given me, whether he remembers it or not, I certainly do remember it, so I appreciate a lot of the, uh, the advice and the kindness that he's offered me personally. When you're ready, Sufi, okay. just uh, turn on the audio as well as the uh, video, please. Yes, I think I've turned on the video and the audio together. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. So, can I continue? Yes, sir. Of course, please. Okay. So, my 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 understanding of fair trial uh, is uh, at two levels. Level one, as I mentioned earlier, 
is in the context of fair trial obligations that are available to any person who is otherwise a free citizen of any normal democratic country. There, the fair trial obligations are monitored and comprehensively overseen by uh, various independent forums like the high courts, the Supreme Courts, the Office of the Ombudsman, and any other. And then there is the freedom to reach out to any of these forums. In addition to that, we also have the luxury of engaging lawyers of our choice. Then the lawyers could be changed if the need be wherever someone feels that he wants to question it differently because the procedural propriety and procedural issues vary from forum to forum from the nature of affairs, mm. nature of proceedings and the legal teams also vary. So the choice of a suspect or someone who's been burdened with any charge has a flexibility to reach out various mm. states of lawyers if he wants to choose. On the other hand, the other situation is where there is an occupying uh, a situation where a power is occupying a certain territory. And in that territory, people who want to resist the occupying power or they want to have an alternative thinking or they wish to rate any kind of peaceful resistance for which they have power and competence under international law, they are being silenced or they are being, they are being parked away or they are being uh, uh, they are in one way or the other put under some kind of a restraint and for that certain charges are pressed which could be genuine which may not be genuine if they are genuine then again the, the freedom of uh, reaching out to lawyers challenging them is a very serious issue and likewise if they are and most of the in most of such cases the charges may not be genuine because the idea would be to uh, to to slap certain provisions to use charges that are very uh, which which attract a lot of punishment person who is who has the power to resist uh, should not be allowed at all his long-term imprisonment should be ensured by declining him bail concessions by declining him other concessions which are procedurally uh, an entitlement of any person so all these create an obligation the fair trial obligation uh, known to every person who's familiar with international spectrum whether it is under Universal Declaration of Human Rights or whether it is Covenant of Civil and Political Rights and whether there are multiple other procedural guarantees given and the judgments have also uh, been given on, on what exactly is the nature of uh, fairness that a trial should ensure. There are uh, extensive judgments in the Indian uh, Supreme Court, they have laid down very detailed procedures on the Pakistani side, even in the Bangladeshi Supreme Court has laid down. So the common law environment in all these three and even fourth country, including Sri Lanka, there is almost a unanimous approach towards what constitutes uh, fairness in the trial and what is a fair opportunity to challenge the procedural steps of the trial. Uh, in cases where we notice in Kashmir, for example, in occupied Kashmir, we notice very distinctly denial of such opportunities. We notice that that fair trial steps that are otherwise available are not being afforded to several prisoners who we think should be afforded. So therefore, I think the national law is supportive clearly of various fair trial conditionalities that must be ensured by all the states. Uh, uh, I'll stop here with my, my initial comments and our follow-up questions, we can take them up later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, uh, pleasure as always, and congratulations on... Uh, um, your, your, I don't want to say... <laughs> I would have said something rather uh, crass, but instead, congratulations. <laughs> um, we have with us also today uh, Barrister Tanvir Hashim Muneem. Yes. He's on the line with us. Uh, Barrister Muneem, is the head of the chambers at Munim and Associates. He obtained his uh, LLB from the University of London after completing his diploma in law from the same university. He then obtained his postgraduate diploma in law uh, from City University in London again and finished his bulk uh, course from the City School, uh, from City University City School. In 2009, he was called to the bar um, and is now an advocate of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh. He's also a member of the Bangladesh Supreme Court Bar Association uh, and listed counsel of the International Criminal Court in The Hague. 
Um, he also listed Council of the United Nations residual mechanism for the international criminal tri uh, tribunals. Um, he is also a member of the Association of Defense Council for International Criminal Tribunals. Um, he is, uh, oh, this, this is a very comprehensive, he's a contributor to the World Bank Group and the Defense Council of the International Crimes Tribunal of Bangladesh and a practitioner in the courts of Bangladesh. His specialization includes, uh, among many things, critical cross-border investment issues, civil and criminal litigation, judicial review, diplomatic law, domestic and international sales, procurement and supply laws, international criminal law, corporate and business laws, trade, <coughs> financing, and others. Um, he also enjoys lecturing on law and is a guest lecturer at some of the universities in the UK. Um, uh, Barrister Tanvir, you have the floor in, on the theme today, which is the right to fair trial. Yes, thank you very much. I hope that you can um, you can hear me proper. We can hear you, with, but yes, yeah. we can see you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm very sorry that I've joined, uh, you know, a bit late, busy in a meeting. So uh, I came across to the idea of this um, webinar uh, just a few days ago. And uh, the topic that we, you know, you have been discussing today, the right to fair trial, is such a vast and, you know, ubiquitous topic that it, uh, it's not possible to discuss about it within a few minutes. But um, I'll just give you an idea how we as a practitioner uh, in the UK as well as in a common law world, we look into it. So when the right to fair trial, this particular thing comes, it's basically in Latin, we know audio alterum partum. So it has its root in basically civil law, but eventually it was developed in the common law countries uh, yeah. in their respective legal system. So the right to fair trial in Europe, uh, basically, uh, they have a European Convention of Human Rights, which protects the human rights across the Europe. This is a which UK and almost all the European Union countries are members or signatories. So the Article 6 is basically the right to fair trial. And there are lots of interpretations coming from the European Court of Human Rights and also the UK Supreme Court, which tells details the constituting elements of this Article 6, as well as there are certain other case laws that tell us um, about the implied uh, elements uh, of this particular right to fair trial. Now, when it comes to, I, I suppose that today we are confronted with the, uh, with um, somehow the talk is related to, you know, to Kashmir. So, <clears throat> So in that case, the right to fair trial, if we borrow the idea from the European Convention of Human Rights, it includes the right to uh, right to be tried by an impartial tribunal, uh, right to be tried, uh, right to be heard, right to engage your own counsel, and a presumption of innocence, and these all sorts of uh, pretty important uh, presumptions that are insulated within the Article Six. So. Um, so when a subject of any country is tried by any uh, tribunal, be that a civil or criminal tribunal, he or she has the right to be tried by an impartial tribunal. So from the international criminal perspective, I just want to give an idea. Let's say uh, there was a lawyer, Jacques Vargas, he is from uh, France, but he's an international criminal lawyer, and he has been uh, applauded as the devil's advocate because he has the um, fame of defending many notorious, allegedly, uh, criminals across the globe. So Jack Sparges, um, he basically was the inventor of the uh, chaos defense. What well, was to attack the very tribunal where he is defending a, a suspect before that particular tribunal. So, for instance, uh, the um, extraordinary chambers in Cambodia or for instance, the, um, the Algerian uh, war crimes trials before different uh, criminal courts at France. Uh, so he appeared and he challenged the very um, authority of that particular tribunal to basically deal with the case. And one of the notion of his arguments was the right to fair trial. Is his client going to get the fair trial by that very tribunal, which has been set up uh, by the very state that's basically um, is the forerunner of uh, of uh, or have is a forerunner of of many violations of human rights, which is well documented and noted. So uh, coming from there, I uh, you know 
I think that those who are uh, who are working in the field of international law, international criminal justice, or cross-border litigations, when it comes to very sensitive disputes, um, you know, like we, we 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 can see between two countries when it, when it when it relates to Kashmir, I mean, the very tribunal who are trying people for violating uh, maybe the uh, black law or black letter law of a respective country, let's say is the Unfair Activities Prevention Act of India. In that case, the tribunal that deals with those particular uh, persons, uh, uh, does it have that real authority to try with them? I mean, the right to fair trial of the individual defendant hinges on, I believe, on the, on this very, very idea whether the tribunal which is trying the defendant has the authority and in real case, in reality, the power to deal with it. Um, so maybe theoretically it has, but practically I think that it's questionable. So um, I won't go farther and I'll rest now. And thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to discuss. As I said, it's, it's, it's a very ubiquitous topic and within a few minutes or an hour, even days, it's not possible to elaborate on it. So, and I, I welcome any question coming from the attendees. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barrister Maureen, uh, for your contribution. You're right, it is a vast subject and I'm glad that you touched upon the Kashmir as well. Uh, the impartiality of tribunals, I think that's something that I wanted to um, to really uh, focus on, especially going into the future, with the prisoners that exist, um, the Indian government have, have locked up, be it Masrat Alam, Asiya Andrabi, uh, Yasin Malik, and I don't know, so many different um, so many different cases that we don't believe, considering that we are a conflict zone, we don't believe in the impartiality of any tribunal, let alone the judiciary, uh, and, the, and the kangaroo courts, which have become an extension of the BJP government. So thank you very much. Um, we have uh, um, one of our speakers has, has been unable to attend, but we do have another panelist in the shape of uh, Mr. Al Dawes, the head of uh, Kashmir Institute of International Relations, based in Islamabad. He has been coming to the United Nations longer than I can remember, um, and has contributed uh, to the Kashmir Institute longer than I've been alive. So we'd be able to hear his thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Amil, for having me on this panel, although this is totally a subject of uh, law, which I am not a lawyer and I do not have that much expertise on the law. But being an activist and having seen ups and downs, in, on the ground and how the things have worked in Kashmir and how the Indian courts have been uh, dealing with the people of Kashmir, with the detainees of Kashmir, with the activists of Kashmir in different ways. That's one of uh, the things which I would like to elaborate on it. And one case in point is that of Muhammad Yasin Malik. I won't deal on that case only. Mohammad Yasin Malik was the chairman of Jumu Kashmir Liberation Front, uh, who denounced the violence in way back in 1994. Uh, he was incarcerated in 90s, then up to 1994, he remained under detentions, uh, suffered torture at the hands of Indians and all that. But at the end of the day, he in 1994 denounced the violence and started a peaceful struggle for the rights and information of the people of Jammu and Kashmir. It was in that course of time when all the Indian intellectuals from all over the India would meet him, would talk to him, would discuss with him this resolution of Kashmir. They would discuss with him how we can de-escalate the tensions in Kashmir, how we can uh, make peace in Kashmir, how we can resolve the uh, Kashmiris uh, in this uh, issue. And then five of the Indian prime ministers met the Yasin Malik, they had their own uh, connections with the Yasin Malik, they had their meetings with the Yasin Malik, they discussed with him uh, ma many more times about it, and many meetings were held from Atal Bihari Vajpayee to Manmohan Singh and others. So at that point of time, the Indians did not say Yasin Malik is a terrorist. At that time, 
he was very much welcomed by all the Indians, by all the Indian leadership, by all the Indian press, and all that was there. But soon after the abrogation of Article 370 and 35A, when it happened that the government of India dismembered the state, humiliated the people of Jammu and Kashmir, you know that all the political leadership in Kashmir, in total, always believed in peaceful struggle. None of them was in favor of violence and all that. But when violence was uh, forced upon them by the Indian, forced upon them by the Indian government, then the violence, violence erupted in Kashmir uh, after rigging the elections, making their own choices of governments in Kashmir and all that. But Mohammed Yasin Malik and other all political leaders, other, other political leaders have never taken to the violence, like Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, uh, late Sayyid Ali Shah Gilani, maybe uh, Ashraf Sarai, Shabir Shah Naeem Khan, uh, Masrat Alam Bhatt and others, they never resorted to the, any violence, they were always peaceful. But Muhammad Yasin Malik was one of the most loud ones at that time because he has denounced the violence and then became the peace activist and became a leader uh, called the uh, New Age Gandhi by the Indian scholars, by Indian, uh, all the Indian press. And but then all of suddenly, when the Kashmir state was dismembered and the people were humiliated and all that, seeing that, that uh, there will be much of resistance in Kashmir, all political leadership of Kashmir was taken um, and put behind the bars and Muhammad Yasin Malik was too arrested. And then all of a sudden we saw a case was stood against him uh, under UAPA, uh, funding the terrorism and leveling him the charges that he was funding the terrorism in Kashmir. Forgetting that, the, all the cases, Angra, Tata, uh, um, Ota, Tata, and all other, uh, the draconian laws which India had enacted in Kashmir, those all cases against Yasin Malik were dropped way back in 1995. But a new case was uh, at that time erupted that he has been funding the terrorism in Kashmir and all that. And then he was not given a fair trial in a way, I will tell you, that neither he was uh, presented in the court physically. He always wanted to be present in the court physically, but he was not given a chance to be present in the court physically in any of the cases. He was asked that you have to be on the uh, Zoom. While he was not allowed to talk, nor he could hear because already Yasin had some problems of uh, that he could not uh, hear some uh, problem of uh, the hearing problems. He could neither hear what the, uh, the prosecutor was saying and nor he could reply, nor he could say anything because he was not allowed to speak. And in these circumstances, the NIA court awarded Yasin the highest of the highest at that time in his, in his view was that he was awarded the life sentence for funding the terrorism, for raising the funds for terrorist activities. This was the case against him. Because Yasin, one thing Yasin which said to the judge when he was asked that, would you like to have your, anybody to advocate on your behalf? He said, no, I myself, I will advocate myself. He said that, uh, do you believe in constitution? He says, no, I don't believe in constitution. I am there for the right celebration of the people of Kashmir. If I am terrorist, then Gandhi was terrorist, then Nehru was terrorist, then all the Indian leaders who have got the independence for India, they were terrorists, then I am also a terrorist then. And this was then they said that he has accepted the charges, he has accepted everything, so he was awarded the life sentence. And now we see after when a year after that, the Indian elections, as they approached, we saw the NIA approaching to the High Court of Delhi, asking for life sentence for Yasin Malik. Because Indian government, the present Indian government, wants a Kashmiri as a scapegoat to win the elections, to say to the Indian public that we have done the, all the legal procedures. Why in 1995, all the cases against Yasin Malik were dropped by then government, by then court, but all of a sudden after 
2019 those surfaced and Yasin was asked that you have to face such and such charges in these cases a uh, number of cases were raised against him so at present uh, the government of india is trying a fast track uh, of uh, a hearing in the high court of delhi in order to avoid yasin malik the life sentence this is uh, what we are facing uh, already we have seen uh, one of our leaders uh, mogbul bhat who was, who also fell to the same circumstances in 1984 he was hanged in the delhi sahar jail and then uh, buried there till date his remains are not given to the people of kashmir again in 1913 we saw another innocent kashmiri who had nothing to do with anything just an innocent kashmiri he was not there to ask for anything at that time when under a conspiracy he he was a charge of attacking the indian parliament abzal guru then at the end of the day when indian supreme court came with the decision uh, that there is no prima facie evidence against abzal guru the prosecution has produced there is no evidence against abzal guru but we have to give him the highest of the highest because to satisfy the uh, general conscience of the indian public who was that that indian public the indian radical hindus to satisfy them the abdul was handed to uh, hanged in the delhi tihar jail in the kashmiri buried there now a line of kashmiris who are demanding the right celebration for the people of jammu and kashmir from shabir shah masrat alam bhat naim ahmed khan and others and our uh, Female leaders like uh, Asia and Rabi, Fahmida, Sophie, and others—they are there. If Yasin is hanged, and then slowly and steadily in the other election, the other leader will be hanged. Then another leader will be hanged. Then another leader, because the BJP has to win the elections on the dead bodies of the people of Kashmir, what they have been doing so far. So there is no rule of law. There is no democracy. There is no. justice when it comes to the people of kashmir when you go to the indian courts recent decision of indian supreme court upholding the government's decision of abrogation of article 370 it was the same indian supreme court which in past had said that this article 370 is non derogable parliament cannot abrogate it it was the same supreme court in 1961 in 1984 the same supreme court gave the decisions but in 2023 we saw the supreme court upholding an unilateral action by the indian government abrogating article 370 dismembering the state of jammu and kashmir and all that this is how indian courts are dealing with the people of kashmir that is why we are here to ask this council and others and we have been crying time and again for justice because we don't expect any justice from the indian courts because they have never done justice to the people of kashmir none of the kashmir has yeah we say asaf sultan a journalist who was under detention for four years five years i think when he was at first he was uh, arrested under psa then uapa was invoked against him and most recently from agra jail he was released uh, by the high court of jammu and kashmir uh, said that he should be released and it took him 72 hours to reach home to srinagar from agra and only 12 hours he could spend with his family the other day he was again arrested arrested because they said he is threat to the peace in jammu and kashmir so he was again arrested under psa so this is situation of uh, the law in a country which calls itself the world's largest democracy uh we had tried in their constitution the very pretty constitution is a very constitution but unfortunately the current uh, political dispensation in india has turned the cons- constitution as well as other things to a uh, right wing hindu 
constitution and everything is done at the behest of RSS and BJP, not under the constitution of India, not under the laws prescribed in the Indian laws. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mani Saab. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, I think there's a lot of research that still needs to be done into the um, criminality, but also the behavior of the Indian government uh, at present as well as in the past. And the, uh, there was a session yesterday, I, I, I remember, uh, by Amnesty, who were talking about the upcoming elections and what they were concerned about was the, um, the, the hatred, the ramping up of hatred and hate speech uh, to win elections and to, uh, to, to force minorities into submission. Uh, this is a reality not just since the BJP came into power, but since long. Um, there is a vision that the Indians believe in. Uh, of course, I'm just a moderator, so I won't go too much into that. We do have two questions uh, from, from the audience, especially from the, uh, from the Zoom. If you'd like to open up those two questions, yeah. maybe we can try and... Um, two questions from Saab. If uh, Sufi Saab is still with us, um, can you update on the individual cases like Asim Bhaktu and Asya Andrabi and Masrat Alam, these prisoners of conscience, and were they offered basic human rights or right to fair trial by the Indian regime? Um, follow up with that is how could a country like India, which has established procedure and practice to ensure fair trial for its own citizens, doesn't allow the same procedures and rights to fair trials to the subjects of UN recognized disputed territory of Jammu and Kashmir? Can Indian occupied um, occupation be held accountable in any international forum? This brazen injustice to people in JK. Excellent questions. Is Sufi Saab still with us? Sufi Saab? Yes. Sufi Saab, if you're available, would you be kind enough to uh, turn on the mic and the video so we may be able to hear uh, your comments on the question that has been asked? He's there, but he's. Sufi Saab, are you able to hear us? Maybe unavailable? He's not, uh, yeah, he's not available. That's fine. Um, I, I can extend that to, to Wani Saab if you'd like to uh, presume to answer that question. See, as far as uh, the question of the fair trial or anything is concerned when it comes to Do Dr. Kasim Fokhtu's case, uh, we have seen Dr. Kasim Fokhtu was implicated in a fake and false accusations were leveled against him of a murder of a uh, Kashmiri pundit, but thereafter he was awarded the life sentence uh, by the uh, judicial magistrate at that time. And then uh, when he completed, the High Court also said that it, uh, there is a life sentence, but when he com com completed, the life sentence in India means 14 years of imprisonment. When he completed 14 years of impri imprisonment in the prison, uh, they approached the court for release. They said, no, it means 20 years. So it was extended for 20 years. And after the lapse of 20 years, when they again approached the court that he should be released, now he has completed 20 years in the prison, uh, it was said that uh, life sentence means life sentence. He has to remain in the uh, detention in the jail for whole of the life. So this is how they come and again, what is written in the Indian constitution, but what the courts, courts spelled out of that uh, 20 years and then whole of the life. And this is the case of uh, Kasim Pokhtu, and he's still there in the jail for last uh, almost 32 years now. And the similar cases go against Asya Indrabi and Masrat Alam and others, Masrat for Masrat Alam. Almost the safety uh, uh, orders for which uh, the amnesty solving door policy, a law, law is being applied against him and the same against the Asya Indra Sahib who is cement, but the Indian government has no mercy on them. They time and again invoke the, all the charges. And Asra Talib is also facing the 20 years and the same is the case with the Asya Indra Sahib they have laid against him. So that is the case there. So we don't expect and uh, we have not seen any justice so far from the Indian courts for the people. Any, in any in one person uh, has not received justice from them. And on the other hand, none of the perpetrators who have been involved in the grave human rights violation
Uh, judicial system because that's all militarized. The judiciary is just the name for Kashmir. It is the military uh, which uh, causes shots in Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, guys.